Hello, and welcome back to Jack Knives Reviews. I'm, of course, your host, Jack Knives. If you missed the first three parts of the countdown, don't worry, there's a link in the description below, or just follow this playlist. But this is it, folks, the final six. Let's get started with number six. Caleb, a 26-year-old programmer at the world's largest internet company, wins a competition to spend a week at a private mountain retreat belonging to Nathan, the reclusive CEO of the company. However, when Caleb arrives, he is now a part of an experiment to interact with the first true artificial intelligence, housed in an android body named Ava. Ava is considered the greatest achievement in human history. She may also be the last. I'm amazed at the amount of people who never talk about this movie. Uh, it, it is legitimately one of the best science fiction movies I've seen at least in the past 20 years. The crafting, the storytelling, visual effects are fantastic. And considering the movie came out nearly a decade ago, it still really holds up today. In fact, the themes and elements throughout the story of AI technology essentially crafting a sort of, are they telling the truth? Are they lying? Are they capable of lying? Do they have cognizance within their own mental capacities compared to a human? Things that we are currently still talking about and is an active part of our reality. And it plays deeply into that but not too much to the point where it becomes superficial and Terminator-esque. It's more practical. Domhnall Gleeson's character, Caleb, plays a good balance between naive and yet scientifically curious enough to keep moving forward. With the contrast of the character of Nathan, who created the android, played by Oscar Isaac, having this really kind of two sides of a coin dynamic of one dabbles in scientific curiosity and the other understands the dangers of it and hence has isolated himself from it despite having been so curious as to put pen to paper essentially and it does play off the dynamic of should they could they would they do they have the actual right to do so but the standout of the entire movie is alicia vikander she legitimately plays off of our real fears of distrust of artificial intelligence, but our hopeful optimism of artificial intelligence being reasonable, being negotiable. And she has the perfect balance of it. I really think she gives off a lot of AI without coming off too much like How 9000 from 2001 A Space Odyssey. She doesn't overplay it. She's creepy yet erotic yet naive, all while still being a manipulator. It's really amazing how much is done with so little. Little expressions, little turns, little things that if it weren't for her physical appearance, you would forget that she's an android. The way she acts, the way she talks, the way she interacts, and it plays off of that heavily. Now, when this movie first came out, it was kind of seen as just far-fetched and unrealistic. But now, it's a real possibility of a look into our near future. What does it mean to deal with technology that's advancing so highly that it's like looking into a weird warped mirror? And this movie handles that concept beautifully. After her elderly mother passes away, Annie, her disturbed daughter Charlie, and son Peter begin to experience strange visions and occurrences in concurrence with their own grief that may have something to do with the supernatural. Hereditary is a horror masterpiece in the sense that it deals with trauma, bombardment, family, and just overall the horrors of what it means to face these things head on and it's so interesting that you see how a grieving family can 
try and fail miserably. This is all an entire showcase of what it means to face things beyond your control. Family forcibly putting you into a box and yet allowing you to try to digest it but keep getting force fed this horror that's coming at you. The more I speak about it, the more I give away a lot of it. But I don't really want to do that if you haven't seen Hereditary. I will say, though, the cast is amazing. Alex Wolf actually, while filming this, broke his jaw filming the school scene where he's in the classroom. And that actually happened. And they kept that specific scene in the movie. And it's more disturbing looking back on it. There's a lot of just pure disturbingness about the movie because it's so gritty, because it's so dark and weird. You are just as confused as the family, but the one who absolutely steals the show is Toni Collette. This is her movie. She should have gotten an Oscar nomination for this movie. I legit believe that. Her character just exudes exhaustion, overwhelming emotion, raw feelings of just purity in its delivery. I barely knew who Toni Collette was before this movie, but after seeing this movie, I was so impressed with her work, I literally started looking back at her back catalog and finding other movies and seeing how good of an actress she is from this, I know now, looking back at her back catalog, how good she is. That is the magnitude of this performance. This is going to be a movie that will always be synonymous with Toni Collette, no matter what she does. She's always going to be associated with this movie because of her performance in this movie. Just like Ari Aster will always be associated with this movie. This was his freshman movie, his first real film and he hit it out of the ballpark with a first time actual filmmaking directing writing producing and it's beautifully dark visceral and just awe inspiring how much is going on with so little the less i say the better Kayla is a young quiet girl in her final year of 8th grade. She constantly battles with social anxiety as well as not feeling like she belongs. She has a YouTube channel that she can give hopeful advice to people similar to her. All the while she is trying to deal with the weird, awkward, and confusing time that is the end of 8th grade going into high school. But it's going to take a lot of experience for Kayla to learn and figure out who she is in such a short time. We're all at least somewhat familiar with Bo Burnham. From his comedy specials to especially the one he released in Netflix during quarantine that kind of all gave us an urgent sense of what is happening. Seeing his inner workings, Bo Burnham is a comedic writing genius. I will give him 100% kudos on that. And that geniusness comes with a balance of unfeeling unease. And the reason I bring that up is because this is his writing and directing debut. That does make a lot of people nervous when a comedian of his caliber is put on a spotlight to give an opportunity to write and direct. And holy shit, this is a masterpiece. This is a freaking amazing movie that somehow captures exactly the feel of what it would be like to be a young girl in the eighth grade now. My generation and the previous generations before me may only understand the concept of what it was like to be a teenager or kid at our age, but I was part of the last generation that was born pre-Google. Now we live in a digital world that is run by computers, technology, and you cannot escape it. So what is it like to grow up in that unease of prepubescence in a digital world? And this movie tackles it in a beautiful way. Elsie Fisher's Kayla really captures what it feels like for someone who, like myself who's never really experienced that 
to try to understand it. I'll never fully understand it, but at least I could try. And this movie allows me to try to experience it and try to understand it. Seeing her day to day get bullied, picked on, or see how she's still uneasy of her looks, her feelings, her demeanors, her weirdness, the things that she's interested in, her interactions with her teacher also, played by Bo Burnham. And it's fascinating the way that Burnham can capture that feeling of isolation in a world of constant interaction. I can't understate how much parents, especially, should watch this movie. If you have any young nephews, nieces, cousins, children especially, you need to watch this movie. It will help explain at least a fragment of what they go through. And granted, not every child will struggle like Kalo does in the movie, and that's fine. But it does allow us as adults and older generations to try to understand. And that's what filmmaking is meant to do. To not just allow us to experience, but allow us to teach others through a adverse characters experience and Burnham understands that this is a fantastic movie that needs to be watched in the 1630s a family of Puritans is banished from their New England community and forced to live on the outskirts of a dark forest. There they try to build a farmstead, but in very little time their infant child disappears. As more and more horrific calamities occur, all of the family turns on the oldest daughter, Thomason, blaming her for the non-stop calamity and tragedies that befall them. But is this the work of the family or darker forces? How do you tell a story like The Witch to a modern day audience? A story that comes right out of the old original scripts of Grimm's Fairy Tales or Hans Christian Andersen. The concept of witchcraft, the concept of paranoia, fear, set in a time before anyone can really understand the world around it. Robert Eggers masterfully answers this question with the witch lighthouse is a movie that he did where he took the isolation of two people inside of a lighthouse but the witch is taking people who are so beset in their ways so isolating themselves in a world they don't understand because that's all it is about paranoia fear of the unknown fear of what is happening to you, why it's happening to you, and what is the cause. Trying to find answers in a world that doesn't have any. Or it does, but you don't accept the answers. This is one of the few movies that I've ever seen that captures the realism, the grittiness, in not a rose-tinted way. When you look at movies set in the 1600s, there's always this Hollywood tint to it to make it less dark and dingy and sad and everything being a struggle for mere existing because that's how it was that is the truth of it was and, and throughout the movie it's a battle of faith it's a battle of not being able to accept the understanding of the world around you it's dark and it plays tricks with your mind. Katie Dickey and Ralph Innocent are so fantastic in this movie. I cannot understate how demanding and irritable and just rough of set in stone they are. And a lot of the concepts that they bring up are how they were back then. This was a time where the thought of religion or anything that was misunderstanding or unknowing 
had to be understood, had to be an answer. That's where terms like witchcraft and voodoo and hatred and magic and this, it was terrifying because the concepts were so set in their ways that they could not be wrong. That it couldn't be the parents' fault. It couldn't be that they didn't know how to raise their children. It couldn't be that they didn't know what was going on. It had to be, there had to be an explanation to the unknown. And the cast has a beautiful dynamic of it. This movie put Anya Taylor-Joy on the map. She was fairly known in the movie sphere, but this movie showed her acting chops. Her feeling of being ostracized by her family, but just not belonging in this world, like she was almost plucked out and put into a family that she shouldn't really belong to. And the movie plays on this unease and tension over and over and just builds and builds and builds and builds and builds to a climax that will ultimately make people re-watch it over and over again. Cementing it as a timeless classic, much like the fairy tales of old. And I think this will always be Robert Eggers' masterpiece. True, he's in the process right now of making a Nosferatu remake, and I personally cannot wait for it to come out. But if it's anything like The Witch, I know that horror, and especially what is now referred to as elevated horror, owes a huge amount of debt to this movie. Danny's sister commits a murder-suicide on herself and her parents, leaving Danny alone with her dysfunctional boyfriend Christian, who unbeknownst to her wants out of the relationship. A bunch of students that are friends with Danny and Christian are invited to a midsummer ancestral commune in Halsingland, Sweden, where things become more and more mysterious and dark, despite the day staying bright around the commune. I've talked about this movie and Ari Aster so much that I feel like I'm just treading old waters. But it truly is a masterpiece. And it does show the purity of art and expressionism in the realm of independent filmmaking and independent horror films. But one of the things I never talk about is the movie itself. Danny is a character played by Florence Pugh really does show what it means to try to distract yourself. Because I think throughout the movie, she is aware that her life that she knew prior is over. Her relationship, her family, what she was before this trip is over. Especially by the end of the film. But what it is, is also a digestion of being unable to let go cabin scene especially with christian having sex in the cabin next to her while the other women are in the cabin with danny mirroring her emotions is haunting and disturbing but it's also what was needed for Danny as a character. She needed to see it, to know that she wasn't alone, to experience it as a whole, allowing her to let her guard down, allowing her to take off the robes of her own anguish. And it deals with it in such a weirdly genuine way, in such a far-fetched setting and place full of weird, colorful people and wonderful visuals that it's almost like a sensory overload, but not in the way that you would expect it to affect the movie. It doesn't affect the movie at all as far as like distraction, but it does affect it in the way of storytelling. It allows you, the audience, to go and just absorb it. You just digest it. You just eat it. It's like giving 
someone a plate of food and they ask what is it and you just say just eat it and Ari Aster understands that because it feels like each of his movies deal with a consequence of grief misunderstanding not fully understanding the world around you but just ultimately digesting it and accepting it even a terrible movie like Bo is Afraid has that same concept but this is his masterpiece no matter what Ari Aster does, and my personal feelings about him, as far as after watching his latest work, my hope is that he goes back to a movie that is like this. A movie that is pure visual, artistic genius. And there's only one movie of A24's catalog is better in every capacity. Evelyn Wang and her husband Waymond own a failed laundromat service. The business is teetering on the brink of financial collapse. On top of that, their marriage and family life with her estranged daughter Joy and her older father Gong Gong are also constant problems for her to deal with. As Evelyn and her husband are forced to go to the IRS, a series of events will take place that will lead down a rabbit hole of multiversal travel, different experiences, different lives, and different realities, all centered around Evelyn that could change all of reality or destroy it. Obviously, I was giving the ending away, but the fact of the matter is everything about this shouldn't work. From the behind the scenes, to the writing, to the directing, to just this film itself. But it beautifully does. The sci-fi, it's a comedy, it's a drama, it's a coming of age story, it's a story about family, it's a story about multiverses, it's a story about magic, wonder, understanding, romance, and all of it with a Chinese cast set in multiple universes in a far-fetched way. It's insane. It really earns the title, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. It deals with things that other movies I feel would be afraid to tackle. This movie shouldn't work, but it does. It does in the most beautiful way. The visuals are immaculately astounding. And the more you go deeper into the filmmaking of it, the more you get shocked and astounded at how good it is. How much shouldn't work for this film. How much should not have succeeded in this film. Michelle Yeoh is such an underappreciated actor. I knew her from a lot of her action movies in the early 90s. I was glancingly familiar with her. There were so many people in this cast that I'm like, oh my god. It got Jamie Lee Curtis an Oscar for the first time in her long career. It got Michelle Yeoh an Oscar. It got Kei Hu Kwan an Oscar. It proved that the redemption arc of Hollywood is not impossible. This movie, in every conceivable way, is a big middle finger to the Hollywood system. The entire movie. It shouldn't work as well as it does. It has googly eyes. It has multi-dimensions. It has multiple universes. It has a gigantic intergalactic everything coated bagel that is the center of the universe. It has jumping from dimensions, action, kung fu, science fiction, body swapping, butt plugs, and hot dog fingers. I'm not joking when I say any of this. This is all in the movie. This is pure chaos in its entirety in the most cemented, amazing way. And the fact that it took so many awards, so many Oscars, and revitalized independent filmmaking for the masses and showed that A24 is a Hollywood juggernaut even outside of the Hollywood system. 
it proved, it cemented A24's legacy forever, being associated with these films. With every film on this list, this is the mountaintop. This is the peak. This is the best of the best of the best. And that's not to say that any of the other movies are bad. Far from it. They're all fantastic. But this is the masterpiece. This is the one that everyone needs to watch. So those are my top A24 movies. What do you think? What are your favorite A24 movies? Let me know in the comments down below. As always, I'll see you next time.